It happened on the 26th of October in 2001 in Fort Worth, Texas, when a nurse's aide, 25-year-old Shantae Mallard, hit a homeless man, 37-year-old Gregory Biggs, with her car, flinging him over the hood where he became lodged in her windshield. And with him still alive and gravely injured, she chose to drive home. Apologizing to the man several times, then pulling into her garage, closing the door, and leaving the man stuck there to die, in which after several hours, and some reports say a couple of days, he succumbed to his injuries. Mallard admitted before he died that he pleaded with her to get help, but she also admitted she was scared and just kept apologizing to him because she had been drinking and taking ecstasy and other drugs at the time she hit him. After he died, Mallard enlisted the help of a friend and his cousin to get rid of Biggs' body. The two men took the body and put it inside the trunk of another car to a local park and left it. Then attempted to destroy the evidence of the crash by setting fire to her vehicle in her yard. Biggs was a homeless man down on his luck, not able to find work when he was killed. When his body was found in the park, police pointed to the fact it appeared to be a hit and run. Then, when Mallard was asked by people she knew why she was no longer driving her car, she told a friend what happened in detail. A search was conducted by police at Mallard's residence where they found the evidence of blood and hair, the burned car with the car seats, one of them burned in her backyard. The medical examiner's office said Biggs died from severe injuries, blood loss, and shock as a result of the accident and the fact she refused to seek medical help for him, which could have made all the difference for whether he lived or died. She, along with her accomplices, were apprehended and brought to trial. Mallard went to trial in 2003 and received 50 years in prison for murder and 10 years for tampering with evidence. She was convicted on the charge of murder and pled guilty to the second offense of tampering with evidence. A wrongful death suit was later filed by Biggs' son, Brandon, who also later forgave her for what she did, and she did openly apologize to Brandon in court after being sentenced. Her accomplices both pleaded guilty to evidence tampering and received 10 and 9 years in prison. It was later reported their names were Cleet Jackson, a former boyfriend of Mallard, and his cousin Tyrone Cleveland. She remains behind bars in Gatesville, Texas, where her projected release date is 2052, although she is eligible for parole in 2027. The more I read about this case and the fact I've read so much about how she feels remorse makes me question the validity of those statements made by her in court. Is she sorry she allowed Gregory Biggs to die? Or is she just sorry she got caught? Because only four months later, before she got caught, she was out partying again as if Gregory Biggs' life had no value. But this would be where she would make the mistake that broke the camel's back because Mallard began talking about the incident at the party to a friend who reported her to the police, which got her arrested.
Was she feeling guilty and had to get it off her chest? Because if that was the case, then why didn't she turn herself in the moment she let him die? Or better yet, why didn't she face the music, call 911, save this man's life in which had she done so, the most she would have received would have been five years in prison. Instead, she got 50 years for murder. Narcissistic personality types who hide their actions gloat about them at parties because two people that had already helped her cover this crime up didn't rat. So why would the friend? Pretty confident for someone who partied and was able to sleep at night for four months before she was arrested. And yeah, she cried a lot on the stand, openly in court, apologizing to the son and family, but that was after she got caught. Plus she pled innocent to the murder charges so she was trying a defense that would get her out of taking responsibility for a man's death in which she hits him with her car, drives home with him in the windshield as he repeatedly asked her to call for help. To which she apologizes while basically saying, sorry, but I don't want to go to jail for this and leaves him to die. And when he finally does expire, she enlists two people to get rid of the evidence. She planned to keep this hidden and to get away with murder. Even after getting caught, she still tries to get away with murder by pleading not guilty to the murder charge. The fact is, on the night of the incident, she went out partying after work, drinking and drugging it up, and decided to drive her car after being extremely impaired. And when she hit Biggs, who did initially survive the wreck, and could have survived if she would have just stopped and called 911. Her selfishness for her own life plans, well, he would just get in the way of that, so she made the conscious decision to allow him to die, then dispose of him like trash in a park. Because of Brandon's forgiveness of his father's murderer, he earned a $10,000 college scholarship award from an unlikely group of donors, prisoners on death row. Convicted murderers from around the country raised the funds from newsletter sales and presented it at a ceremony to Brandon, who is now a student at Southwest Assemblies of God University in Waxahachie, Texas. Here are the recorded transcripts from court the day Mallard took the stand to reveal what happened, her apology to Brandon, and Brandon's response, and how Brandon made a difference that would have made his father very proud of him today. Mr. Biggs. Okay. And when you hit Mr. Biggs, did you see him before you hit him that you remember? No, sir, I did not. Okay. And what how was the first thing that happened that made you know that you hit Mr. Biggs? When I hit him, it was a real loud, very loud noise. And all this glass started flying in the car followed by a lot of wind and the glass was just it was just cutting in my skin it was just stinking me That's what and I really knew did you know what happened first when you heard the sound and felt the glass no I didn't what, were you driving on the roadway when this happened yes I was when is the first time you realized that a, a body had come into your car The word I, um, at the wind and everything, and I went ahead and exit Village Creek. I looked. This was the first time I noticed. So when you heard the sound and heard this and the crash, the glass was coming in, and then then the wind from outside. And the, how far was it? Do you think? To where you took the exit and saw you had a body in the car. I can't be exact. Do you have any idea how long it actually was? Uh, I don't know what seconds or a couple few minutes. I'm not exact. I, no, I really couldn't. When you 
looked over, when you took the exit and you looked over and saw that uh, there was a body in your car, just tell the jury the position that the body was in. Mr. Bates came all the way inside of my car. He was, I'd never seen his face. He was like on the floor. Um, Which floor? Now where on the floor? On, on the passenger side of my car. Like underneath the dashboard. And uh, it's like uh, one leg. It's like somewhat out the, the front glass. And how much of one leg was outside the front glass? Like uh, at the crease of maybe the knee down. Did the glass on the passenger side come in all the way? Yes, it did. What, what happened then? I exited Venice Creek and I made a left and I went over the overpass. Yeah. And you, you made a left at Village Creek? Yes, I did. And then where'd you go? I, I made the first right on Martin Street. And I went up to the stop sign and I stopped. I made that first right at the stop sign and I stopped right there at the stop sign. And I got out the car. Okay. I sat in the car for a few seconds. And I got out the car. Oh. I was just screaming. And I, I got out the car. And I was just screaming. And I was crying. And I eventually walked around to the passenger side of the car. Okay, and when you walked around the passenger side of the car, what were you thinking? The, I seen a man's leg, and I didn't know what to do. Okay. And what did you do? I touched his leg. How long did you touch his leg? Oh, one quick second. And what happened when you touched his leg? I just, I panicked even more, and I started screaming. And then I just kind of cried. I just started yelling. Okay. And do you know how long you stood outside the car? No, I don't. Do you remember getting back in your car? No, not really. No. Did, did, did you start driving your car? Yes. I stopped driving a Martin. Okay. And did you eventually come to your street? Yes, I did. Do you know how long it took you to drive? No, I, I don't recall. While you were driving, did you hear any sounds from Mr. B? Yes, that was the first time I heard him. He moaned. Have you seen what drugs have done to your life? Yes, I have. They have destroyed my life. Do you need treatment for drugs? Yes, I want treatment. You want to make sure you never get back on drugs again? Yes, I do. Tell me why. Tell, tell the jury why. Because I have ruined lives of other people. I have ruined my family's life. I have put people through pain. And I am so truly sorry. I am so sorry, Brandon. I'm so sorry for what I have caused your family. And I'm sorry for the pain that I have put my family through. And I'm also sorry for the how I have done to society. I really am very sorry. She isn't sorry. She is just sorry she got caught. Otherwise, she never would have covered it up. Even as she drove home with him stuck in her windshield alive, begging for help, she made the decision to leave him in that awful, suffering position until he died. That was her solution to saving her own ass. 
at the cost of a life so she could keep her sustained and accustomed to the way she wanted to live. No regard for Gregory Biggs' life in the least. Brandon Biggs, Gregory's son, is probably a better person than most. He is a good-hearted soul, probably just like his dad was. And for him, forgiveness was the right thing to do so that he could move on with his life and hold strong to his religious faith in God and his teachings about forgiveness. And Brandon is not a fool. He didn't forgive her because he felt she was sincere in her apologies. He was just the bigger person and stronger than most people would be in these situations if this had happened to their loved one. Brandon is one of those whose faith is so strong, he has that ability to forgive and to be able to move his life in a forward and positive direction, and that is exactly the outcome of his life today. First of all, we would like to thank the jury. You've been so patient, and we would just like to say thank you. Uh, to the Mallard family, we would like to say that we're sorry for your loss as well, because there are no winners in a case like this. It's just as we all lost Greg, you all will be losing your daughter. But while you will have phone calls and correspondence and visitation, we don't have these anymore. So in return, I would ask that you would guide Shantae and that you'd pray for her and that you'd protect her. But we'd like to say that we're sorry for your loss as well. To Shantae, I, I personally would like to say that I would accept your apology. But in return, I hope that you would accept my forgiveness. And I hope you'll accept the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. While forgiveness is given, restitution is still required. So I ask that during your punishment, you'd seek the advice and the wisdom of your family and your loved ones so that you can live a productive life. As the judge read the verdict, Shantae sat with her head down, silently weeping, knowing she had ruined her life over one horrific choice, where one person made a choice and the other had none. And I'll ask the presiding juror, is this the unanimous verdict of the entire jury? Yes, Your Honor. In cause number 037. 152D styled State of Texas versus Shantae Juan Mallard. Verdict form is to count one. We, the jury, having found the defendant, Shantae Juan Mallard, guilty of the offense of murder, assessor punishment at confinement in the Institutional Division of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for a period of 50 years, and in addition to such confinement, assess a fine of none. And we further do not recommend community supervision signed by the presiding juror. Verdict form is to count two. We, the jury, having found the defendant, Shantae Juan Mallard, guilty of the offense of tampering with evidence, assessor punishment at confinement in the Institutional Division of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for a period of 10 years, and in addition to such confinement, assess a fine of none, and we further do not recommend community supervision signed by the presiding juror. In 2005, just a few years after her conviction, she appeals her case against the state of Texas on both the murder conviction that she pled not guilty to and the tampering with evidence to which she did plead guilty to in her trial. She argued the evidence presented in her trial was legally insufficient, lacking fact for her murder conviction, and that her trial court 
erred from transferred intent in the jury charge to being erred in an overruling for her motion for a mistrial, basing that the state's alleged comment on her post-arrest silence. The fact she only spent a couple of years in jail to which she openly apologized for her actions was just a facade. On the night of the incident, she went out partying after work, drinking and drugging it up, and decided to drive her car after being extremely impaired. And when she hit Biggs, who did initially survive the wreck and could have survived if she would have just stopped and called 911, her selfishness for her own life plans, he would just get in the way of that. So she made the conscious decision to allow him to die, then dispose of him like trash in a park. It's simple. She is a murderer, and the fact she tried the first time to get out of it and then appealed the case only a couple years later proves it. She isn't sorry. She is just sorry she got caught. Otherwise, she never would have covered it up. Even as she drove home with him stuck in her windshield alive, begging for help, she made the decision to leave him in that awful, suffering position until he died. That was her solution to saving her own ass at the cost of a life, so she could keep her sustained and accustomed to the way she wanted to live. No regard for Gregory Biggs' life in the least. We all make mistakes in life and we always have a choice. It's how we learn from mistakes and make good choices that matter. Everything she did before this, every good deed, every accomplishment, every person she helped while working as a nurse's aide, she abracadabra made all that good disappear. She will never be defined in life by any good deed before this because murdering a man in such a selfish manner while letting him die a slow, agonizing death, then treating his corpse like a piece of gum stuck to the bottom of her shoe and discarding him like trash, then staying the course in life as usual, maintaining high hopes for her life, was now over. She isn't a 25-year-old young woman with her whole life ahead of her anymore. 50 years in prison is a life of limbo, a daily routine of hell on earth, locked away from freedom, hopes, and dreams. And it all changed in an instant by one extremely bad choice. She knew it was wrong, but did it anyway. She knew he could have lived if she had only called 911. But her ego was at stake, her reputation and future. She thought only of herself. She put his fate in her hands, played God, and allowed him to die. She murdered him. Even if she gets out one day, whether it's early or she serves out her entire sentence, she will never truly be free. She will always be a murderer, a prison number stigma. Outside of prison walls, she will never be young again. She will never relax in a nightlife of partying with friends, land that dream job, meet the man she will marry, raise a family, or grow old, spoiling grandchildren. She will never live out that American dream she so desperately wanted. Because she chose to end that in 2001, 20 years ago when she murdered Gregory Biggs. There's an old simple saying, an important code one should live by when making decisions that should be well thought of beforehand. Some bells 
you just can't unring. A few TV series like CSI, Law and & Order, and the FX anthology series Fargo were also inspired by this true story and adapted them into their shows. In Fargo season two, Kirsten Dunst's character plays a woman who hits a man played by Kieran Culkin with her car in which he gets stuck in her windshield and she drives home, parks the car inside the garage and enlists her husband, played by Jesse Plemons, to help her take care of the situation, much like Mallard did when she enlisted her two friends, one being an old boyfriend, to help get rid of the body and the car. It also served for the basis for the 2007 film called Stuck, starring Mina Suvari, after a woman played by Suvari commits a hit and run after a night of celebrating and drinking, who just like Mallard in real life, puts the man's fate in her own hands by not seeking help out of fear she will be in trouble and go to prison and letting him die instead. Just like in the real life case, she leaves the man trapped in the windshield for days inside her garage until he dies and then enlists her boyfriend to help her hide the evidence. The case was revisited again in 2017's Midnighters, directed by Julius Ramsey, when a married couple who were out celebrating New Year's Eve hit and killed a man with their car, then stored his body in the garage while they hatch a plan to cover it up. Ramsey said he was inspired to write this film after reading about the Mallard case in the newspaper.